This is definitely the best way of getting through this place. Every hour I'm on this river saves me a day of chopping through all that. But late rains have swollen the river. My easy ride will soon be quite a roller coaster. The water's starting to pick up now. Time to bail. Try to reach those overhanging tree branches. No way I could have gone any longer on this river. It's flooding. No banks, no eddies. There's nothing I could have done except for jump off. I got everything I need from here on out. It's over land. See what else this place can throw at me. I'm Hayes and Adele. Wilderness Explorer. I'm embarking on the longest and most challenging expedition I've ever attempted. Something I've dreamt about since my youth. When I was younger, I spent many years of my life in the Amazon. And the great Andes Mountains were always in the far, far distance and were always intriguing to me. And now, that's right where I'm going. My journey to and over the Andes will take me through some of the toughest environments in South America. Starting in hostile jungle, I'll cross sun-scorched savannas and wild wetlands. Then climb through brutal cloud forest to the frozen high plains and snow-capped peaks of the high Andes before descending into the infamous Atacama Desert and my ultimate destination at the Pacific Coast. I'm here during the autumn equinox. That means the duration of day and night are the same. But every day after this, as I get closer to the Andes, the days are gonna get shorter and shorter. I'll be racing the sun west, trying to cross the high mountains before the winter snows. But it'll be worth it. Now is the time of harvest and ritual. The chance for me to experience some unique festivals and traditions that few outsiders get to see. Crossing the Andes during this time of the year is full of challenges. And it'll take everything I've got as far as survival skills, knowledge, endurance. But if I complete this, it'll be one of the biggest feats of my life. And my challenge starts here in the Atlantic forest where I must first find a route west through thousands of square miles of harsh jungle, swamps, and wild waterfalls to a remote Guarani village. At this time of year, the community marks the changing of the seasons with a special annual forest hunt and festival feast. If I can make it through the jungle in time, I have a chance to experience this unique tradition for myself. There were remote Guarani settlements throughout the Atlantic Forest. But this place is also home to other residents, including caiman, jaguar, and deadly vipers. But these are not the only hazards in this jagged jungle. <laughs> wow. <sighs> you know, I'm not the only thing trying to survive here. Everything that's living is trying to do the same thing I'm doing. And as far as all the animals that are here, they're trying to eat and they're trying not to get eaten. And the same thing goes with plants. 
Plants are trying to get as much sun as they possibly can and not get eaten. So they're either full of poisons or they arm themselves. Look at the barbs and spines on this plant. Yeah, this is not an easy place to get through. It's tough going. <sighs> and it's only gonna get tougher. It's hard to find a route through this place. This forest is very dense, very wild. But if you know where to look, this place is full of survival scores. Cool. Melopanini bees, they're a little small stingless bee and they make lots of honey. Melopaninis often construct their hives deep inside hollow trees, protecting themselves from predators. I can hear the hives right in here. So if I just make a little opening, try to be as discreet as I can, get a little bit of honey and uh, then close up their home, I'll get a really good hit of sugar. But the bees won't give up their honey without a fight. They may be stingless, but melopininis bite hard. Some even secrete formic acid, like adding salt to the wound. It's really bad when they get inside your ears, because it's like when they get deep inside, it's like you're scraping at the insides of your brain. Not the nicest. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, there's the hive. It's in there. If I can just reach. Oh yeah, they're crawling all over. Ah. Ah. There's honey. You can use this moss like a sponge. Okay, shove that in and just wipe it in there. Oh, yeah. Mmm. Oh, my God. That is so delicious. Mmm. Oh, my God. There is nothing sweeter in the jungle than that right there. Mmm. Oh. I don't want to overdo it. Boy, we are all buzzing right now. I'll take only what I need. The bees have to have their winter food. I can plug up the hole that's there, and then these bees will just seal up any leaks in their nest with beeswax, and uh, they'll be back to normal in no time. Whew. I am very sticky. Those sweet calories are a much needed energy boost for the hard miles ahead. Yeah. It's almost impossible to cover any ground in here. It's slow going. <sighs> Look at that. Any clearing is a welcome break from the thick jungle. but all the rains have created a new challenge. See how flat it is? The water doesn't have any place to go, so it turns into swamp. It might not look like it, but the best route is just to beeline it across sometimes. Circumnavigating this swamp will burn time and energy and take me off track. But crossing it is a calculated risk. Yeah, you never quite know exactly what's in water like this. So, yet another adventure. Still stagnant water is a draw for many creatures, including the broad-snouted caiman, which can grow to over 10 feet. Okay, up to my belly button now. I need to get through here without attracting any unwanted attention. That's the point of no return. Okay. 
So right now, it feels like it's just me and the swamp and the hundreds of other kinds of things that could be living in here. I don't exactly know. <sighs> okay. Okay, definitely halfway across. Good so far. But there's one final obstacle in my way. Sawgrass. You gotta go through this stuff real gently because it slices you right open. And cuts along with this water. That's a horrible combination. Recipe for big time infections. Waterlogged grass is an ideal place where alligator species build their nests. I need to be on the lookout. Okay. Okay, good deal. Okay. It's kind of gross, but could have been a lot worse. But the dangers here, hold on, don't just lie beneath the water. Where is your head? There. Ooh. <laughs> yes, I know exactly what this is. Come here. This is where you find these kind of snakes. This is called a spilotes. When they're around people, a common name for these snakes are called chicken snakes because they love to eat chickens. Chicken snakes also eat small mammals and lizards. And adults can grow to almost nine feet. They can sense movement. They're a pursuit predator. So when they see something that they want to eat, they will chase after it through the grass, up through the branches, down holes, through the chicken cages. And uh, once they grab a hold of their prey, they're a really powerful constrictor, almost like a boa constrictor. Oh, here, look at this. That does not want to let go. It's like having a, another arm at the very end of their body. Yeah, it's very strong. It's like a prehensile tail on a monkey. But that's another telltale sign that this is a tree living snake. I think we've both had a good look at each other. I'll just leave it just like how I found it. I'm glad to leave the swamps behind me, and I've looked out and found a forest trail. Do you hear that? We're pretty close. Paulo is from a nearby Guarani village, a sister settlement to the one I'm aiming for. Ah, this is veneno. Veneno. Ah, bueno. Para los peces. Ah, uh -huh. quiero verla. The community has made a dam in the nearby river to create a pool, providing it with a regular supply of fresh fish. The fish are getting trapped in there, and then whatever chemical compounds are in this woody vine are stunning the fish, so they're easy to collect in the, all this water. I've seen poison vines used in fishing elsewhere in the tropics, but this one is new to me. ¿Cómo se llama este? Chimbo. Chimbo. Mm -hmm. They call this chimbo the Guarani. It has a very unique smell something sort of rotten, something sort of like it has body odor. It's, it's strong, yeah? Muy fuerte. La... Muy fuerte, sí. Mm. Sí, sí, sí. Pero, ¿es pelagos para gente o no? Pa para la gente no, okay. no se ve. The chemical compounds that are in this chimbo are having a dramatic effect on the fish. I can already see a lot of the fish, they're just swimming so slowly. Every once in a while, you see them come to the surface in this milky water. Yeah, the poison is really taking effect. Aquí, aquí está. Yeah. Hey. Wow, these are big. In my experience, wow. 
These kinds of toxins usually only stun smaller fish or weaker fish. Whatever is in this chimbo is powerful stuff. These are called placosimus, but they're also called armored catfish just because of those scales that are like parts of a shield. And then, of course, it has those big, heavy-duty spines that just lock into position. Very beautiful, but also, gosh, they look like something very prehistoric. They're all over in this river, but without the poison, they move so fast, they'd be almost impossible to catch. Oh, lo bueno. Yeah. Está rico es? Si? Bueno. Yeah. We got a pretty good haul today. The toxin will get diluted by the river's current, and we've got what we need. So Paolo invites me back to the village. It's a typical Guarani community that survives on the bounty of the surrounding forest. And Paolo has lived here all his life. He gives me advice on the best route onwards to my destination, the Guarani settlement on the western edge of the jungle. But there's a waterfall descent that could shave days off of my journey. Okay. Bueno, bueno. And he has a gift he asked me to deliver for the autumn festival feast. The leaves of a special plant called ka'a, mm -hmm. which the Guarani make into a herbal drink believed to have special healing qualities. Paolo sends me on my way with one of the fish we caught. But dinner will have to wait. I need to make quite a bit of progress before dark. Whoa. This is the biggest danger in the forest right here. This is a jarara. These snakes right here are considered the most dangerous snake down here in Southern South America. They're an ambush predator, so they lie and wait. They'll find a perfect place to hide, wait for its prey to come by. But if there's a person that comes by, accidentally winds up getting too close to the snake or winds up stepping on the snake, the snake has no choice but to defend itself. So over 50% of venomous snake bites in this part of the world are caused by the jarara. The jarara is a cousin of the infamous fertilans and a member of the pit viper family. When you look at that head, it has these eyes with slit pupils, a lot like a cat. But right underneath its nostril, it has these little holes and also along its right along its upper lip. Those are heat sensing pits, so it can actually see heat. It's something that humans uh, can't, can't do. That's a sense that, that we don't have, but see how it's flicking its tongue. These snakes also have a very well evolved sense of smell and they can smell with that tongue. They're basically getting all the information that they need by sensing what's happening in the air. It smells humans, it smells the forest, it smells its prey. The Yarara are primarily nocturnal. It's a lucky encounter to see during the day where they're typically less active. You're talking about perfection of evolution right here. The Yarara pit viper. So beautiful. So I'm just gonna let it go back into the forest. That was a big bonus for the day. Okay. And the day is almost over. Sun is going down and I'm on very limited time to figure out a place to spend the night. If I don't get cracking, I'm gonna get in trouble. I need to build a shelter, but around here, materials are limited. Yeah, here's just a young shoot, but this bamboo is really thin-walled, but it's growing everywhere. I wish this place had more to offer, but I gotta make do with what I have. This species of bamboo is pretty fragile, but I can turn its weakness into my advantage. Since this is so thin, I just need to 
crush the bamboo. When you crush the bamboo, just like that, and it'll lay flat. I take all these pieces and elect like big, long shingles for my roof. For my frame, I can use the stand of trees right from where they're growing. That might just be the pitch of my roof. I can bend these limber saplings into position rather than cutting them down. That's handy. There we go, nice. I just have to make a shelter for one night. So it's just has to be quick and dirty and keep me dry if it does decide to rain tonight. These horizontals here, they're gonna act like rafters that I can attach my shingles to. Yeah, be really careful with this stuff because it's just so sharp. But it's starting to pile up, and the more I pile up, the more it's gonna work. With the sun dropping fast, it's a race to get my roof on without cutting my hands to shreds. There we go. All right, I'm amazed that I didn't wind up being a bloody mess. But this is my roof, and it looks crude but it's gonna work really well. It's time to make a fire. Finding dry tinder in this wet forest will be a challenge. I'll need to improvise. If I untwist this natural fiber rope, it's made up of a bunch of really small fibers. Those work really well. I'll use a hand drill method to get a fire started. Hopefully. So first, just go nice and easy. This takes a lot of energy and it's a muscle burner. So right now, just get this initially warmed up. Now the technique and hard work begins. Without a fire, I won't be able to cook my fish and I'm facing a cold, dark, wet night ahead. <sighs> okay, there we go. Looking good. Okay, there's a little cold. Okay, that's good. Have something to hold it here, okay? There we go, there we go, there we go. There we go, there we go. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, good. There is fire by the skin of my teeth, I tell you. With a healthy bed of coals, it's time to cook my fish. They're so tough, they will actually cook themselves in their own plate of armor. In only a couple of minutes, dinner is served. So these come with their own <laughs> handle, really. There, that was right in the coals, just like so. Really nice, tasty white meat. Some people might not think those are very pretty fish. I think they're neat looking, and they really don't have very many bones at all. They're also very tasty. Yeah. Mm. Oh. Hot, 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 hot. Nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. After such a long day, I'm hoping for a quiet night. But the jungle never rests. <sighs> Oh, God. Get this fire going. What just happened? Okay. What is that? Okay, I gotta show you this. <laughs> oh, well, if I was scared of spiders, I would have been out of here a way long time ago. But, um... Yeah, when the night comes out, the creatures come out, and <laughs> that just goes with the territory. 
you know, life's too short to be super scared of spiders. You can be cautious of them, but being scared of them is just sort of a wasted energy. That spider was probably here first. This is its home, and I'm sleeping in its living room, so I'm just gonna let it go back upstairs, uh, and uh, I'm gonna try to get back to bed. I'm up with the sun, and on the lookout for a quick breakfast. Oh, nice. So, take this trunk of this tree, go all the way up into those branches, and it's almost like these alien growths coming right out of the wood of the tree. I think that's called coliflorous growth, rather than a fruit at the end of the branches, it just comes right out of the wood of the tree. They're called jabutigaba. They're really delicious. Yeah, there we go. Cool, it's working. They look a lot like grapes. Mmm, mmm, mmm. Oh, they're really nice. Inside, inside they're uh, almost like a gelatiny fruit called a lychee. Really sugary. The skin is real tart and tough, but boy, when you put them in your mouth and they just sort of explode. <laughs> and they're really nice. See that? It's that white flesh that's inside. That's juicy. Mm. <laughs> With some seeds that you can just crunch right through. What a score. Chibutigaba. I could make a feast of these. Nice. I'm continuing to follow the sun west on my epic journey to the mighty Andes Mountains. My immediate goal is the Warani settlement on the western edge of this Atlantic forest. And time is short if I'm going to make it for their traditional autumn hunt and feast. You hear that? That's good, that's good. Just like Paolo said, if I'm on the right ridge, keep following this up, and I should hear a waterfall. You can hear that right there? If conditions are right, this could mean a huge shortcut for me. Yeah. But the recent rains have turned this Guarani backway route into a raging wall of water. is so slippery and so covered with water, it's impassable. Impassable, impossible. There might be a way down. I'm going to need a rope, a long one. These might look like vines, but actually they're not at all. Believe it or not, they're roots that are coming down from big plants that are growing on the branches of it looks like that big tree there. The young philodendron roots are not strong at all, and the old ones can be brittle. Yeah, these ones right here. They're good and tough and solid. This is a good start. Get a couple more of these. Yeah, there we go, good. But even the best roots I can find are not long enough or strong enough for this descent. The height of that cliff looks like it's about 40 feet high. These vines, probably only about 20 feet long. And I'm going to braid these together because a fall from 40 feet, if one of these roots decides to uh, break from that height, I wouldn't make it. Braiding several roots together should at least double, maybe even triple the strength and length of my jungle rope. It's starting to go now. You want to lay it nice and flat and make sure that all of these pieces of root are really gripping onto one another. That's what makes it nice and strong. 
It only takes one small weakness in this rope that could kill me. I take my time to make it right. In some places, I really had to double up because the roots started to get pretty small, I guess, in diameter. But this is, yeah, good and strong. It's a philodendron root rope, and it's time to put it to the test. Holds are impossible. I have to trust all my weight on this rope. I'll need to swing across. Okay, here it goes. Each swing puts more and more strain on my rope. Super strong. Okay. Well, the worst of my day is over. I hope. The waterfall saved me some time. And I'm making good headway towards the Guarani village on the western fringe of the forest. All I need now is some energy for the final push. You should be right around in there. The very outer coating of this palm is very, very hard. It's the inside that's nice and soft. But I'm getting there. From plenty of jungle experience, I know what's inside. Okay, I can see the burrows. Gives me a good idea of the size of the beasts that are living inside there. Look at right there. That is a tunnel <laughs> right there. And uh, okay, they're in here. Okay, yeah, there we go. This is what I was looking for. Get in there. Don't bite me. <sighs> okay. <laughs> that is the weevil larva. These larvae are from the South American palm weevil, and they're some of the biggest in the Americas. They are pretty stunning as far as beetle grubs go. As far as their bodies are, they're sort of uh, very fleshy, but then that head is very hard. And it has these big jaws uh, that are powerful. Ow. Yeah. They do, they, <laughs> they do bite. These baby beetles are high in protein and taste better than they look. They're considered a delicacy out here. And you can just grab that head and... Uh, Yeah. Mmm. Yeah. They taste, they're incredibly juicy inside. And then nice and rubbery on the outside. You, you don't want to eat the head because, well, for me, they make my, my mouth itch. And even, even after they get decapitated, they keep moving those jaws and then they could bite you on the way down. So I just... Um, yeah, throw those aside. These logs have been deliberately placed and left 
to grow a dependable source of protein for the locals. So I'm gonna put these back like how I found them. There's still lots and lots of grubs left in all these logs. And uh, from what I see, there should be people around. I can't be far from the Guarani settlement. I'm sure these are their hunting grounds. Woo! So I need to be careful. Woo! I don't want them mistaking me for game. Woo! Woo! There's somebody here. Hola, ¿cómo estás? Bien. Oye, vete. Siete. Siete. Hola, ¿cómo estás? Bien. Bueno, bueno. Hola. Hola, estoy Hola. Hazen. Estoy domingo. Domingo, Ajá. domingo. Bueno, bueno. Hola. ¿Cómo estás? Bien, bien. Bueno. Soy Ariel. Bueno. ¿Eres de, de aquí, ustedes? Sí, estamos, somos de acá, tenemos nuestra comunidad acá. These guys are from the Guarani village I've been aiming for. ¿Cómo estás acerca de aquí? Ajá. ¿Para qué? Eh, queremos cazar un jabalí. Ah. Eh, Teresa, le invito. Claro, vamos. Claro, claro. Okay, I've bueno. made it just in time. Este día. Mm. Bueno. Wow, you're hunting vale. right now. Let the hunt begin. They're just looking for every little bit of evidence of what animals have been passing through here for the last couple days and nights. Little prints, little chew marks, some scat that's around. Oh, yeah. So it says there's, there's peccary tracks. Peccaries resemble wild pigs and are prized by the Warani. One animal is enough for the whole village, perfect for the autumn feast. They can see footprints of two fully grown peccaries, and then they've seen one baby so far. The way they can look at the land is like, is like them seeing a movie. And the Warani have seen this movie before and have a plan. They just explained to me that they're gonna send up Ariel up forward. He's the best shot of all of us. He'll get up into the branches, out of sight of the pigs. And then, since we know the pigs are around, we're gonna try to find them, not spook them. And then we'll just slowly and methodically corral them towards Ariel. For this hunt to work, we have to get the peccary into Ariel's shooting range. were here just minutes ago. But where are they right now? We're spreading out. More than likely, the peccaries know that we're around. They're in hiding. We're just gonna be nice and slow. We don't wanna spook the animals. We can't see them, but we know we're close. You can smell them, and the smell is so rich in the air. And there's a sighting. You see it? There's just one, just one. There it is, right. It's going right behind the bush. There's there, there's there. there. You see, you see, you see, you see. It's walking right into the ambush. Peccary is in range. Perfect shot, perfect. Yeah. Did, did, did Domingo, yeah? Tienes? Yeah, they got it, they got it. 
Here we go. <laughs> Very good hunt. Perfect. Bueno. Perfecto, yeah. These guys have been doing this for so long that they did it exactly how they planned it. Wow. Good shot. <laughs> Amazing. We take the peccary back to the village. Preparations for the feast have already begun, and the whole village has turned out. They've been expecting us, and this is the welcome ceremony. Muy vete. Tonight's festival marks the turning of the seasons, from the time of plenty to the coming of winter when food is scarce. For the hunters, this is a symbolic moment. This is a traditional gift that's being given to me by Domingo. It's a hunting gift. It's the front hoof of the peccary that we just killed. Bueno, gracias. Muchas gracias. gracias. Bueno. Bueno, bueno. So he kept one of the fingernails and I have the other, and this is a this is luck. I'll bring this with me next time I go hunting. This feast will feed everyone. Para mí. Ah, gracias. Está caliente. Okay, bueno. Gracias. By blowing the tobacco smoke over our peccary. It's a way of, of blessing the food. Very much a part of the custom when a large animal like this is killed for the, for the community. It's a part of the life and culture of the Warani, dictated by the seasons and the sun. Exactly what I came here to see. You know, just these moments and experiences like this with the Warani, that makes it all worthwhile. It's all the help along the way that can teach me, that can help me. These are the people that enable me to get as far as I can. These are the moments I cherish. This is uh, more than just an adventure for me. My time in the jungle is almost over. From here on out, the journey to and over the Andes only gets bigger, tougher, and wilder. That's the Paraná River, and it's my way out of the Atlantic forests, continuing my journey westbound into the savannas. Next time, I tackle the scorched savanna grasslands of the Gran Chaco, known to locals as Infierno Verde, Ugh. green hell. <laughs> <laughs>